Off you go, Bob. Okay, well, welcome everybody. As Ken mentioned, I'm the president of the Midland Penetanguishing Field Naturalist, Bob Codd. Our speaker tonight is Claudette Sims. She's subbing for Kathy Avasalis, I hope I said that correctly, who is unwell and unable to participate. Um, we've also got members of the Midland Garden Club here with us tonight, so I want to welcome everybody who is from that club. So, welcome. Um, so quick uh, club business to, to bomb through. Um, we received an official thank you letter from uh, participants of our most recent youth, youth Summit for Mother Earth. Ontario Nature has asked us not to share the document online to protect these young participants but I can share the sense of gratitude from those who took the time to write us with their appreciation. And if you look behind me, this is this is part of their thank you that they sent to us. Unfortunately, it's not showing the full thing. It got cut off in the, in the translation to Zoom, but it does say, thank you, Midland Penetanguin, she feel naturalist. And I thought that was a nice personal touch. So that's something we did uh, we did very well. Um, their thank you goes something like, thank you for supporting the 2023 Youth Summit for Mother Earth, exclamation point. Your gener generosity brought together young Ontarians from diverse backgrounds and experiences and gave us the opportunity to generate positive social and environmental change. Together, we champion nature, conservation, and gain insights which will shape our lives for the better. So. That's kind of nice. Um, another reminder, on January 28th at 10 a.m. at the Y Marsh, uh, we'll be hosting our indoor-outdoor outing uh, in person at the Y Marsh. And their speaker will be Deepthi Rajapaska, who will be sharing photos and her experiences from her most recent trip to uh, Sri Lanka. So she's. Uh, I'm working on putting this presentation together I got to warn you, there's a ton of photos there, and it's being pretty hard to sift through the ball to, to find the best ones. But we'll 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 do our best, and hopefully we can get through that. Um, on a related note, from Y Marsh, Kim Hacker of the Y Marsh has generously offered to provide our room rentals at no cost to us in exchange for a group membership in the Midland Penetang Field Nats. This is a huge for our 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 club to get these rooms at no cost. And it's a wonderful thing they're doing. So in return, I urge all of you to go out and support the Y Marsh with, with whatever, whatever you can afford or whatever you can contribute. Um, also to let you know that the field that's uh, executive has signed on to Ontario nature's provincial budget consultation submit submission. Uh, we're urging the province to launch a Wild Ontario Accelerator Fund and to secure opportunities to protect more wild spaces and to advocate for investment in protected areas. I know we all wish ourselves good luck with that, right? <laughs> Another note from the MTM Conservation Association. Their newsletter is now available online. You go to their website and you'll see that. And uh, finally, a reminder to all of our members that our 2024 membership fees are now due. So cough up, everyone. We need the money. <laughs> you can send a check uh, or you can email our treasurer with an e-transfer. And I believe if you look at Ken's screen when he comes back on, he's got the email address behind him. Treasurer at mpfn.xyz. So... Um, right at this moment, I'm going to introduce Dave Scanlon, and he's going to tell us all about the results of our uh, 2023 Christmas bird count. Just just before we do that, Bob, hold on one second, Dave. I forgot to press the button that mutes everybody. Oh. So I, I think uh, just for safety, I'm going to do that now. And uh, then, uh, Dave, you can unmute yourself. So yeah. here we go, everybody. Everybody is now muted, and off you go, Dave. Unmute yourself and give us the give us the goods on the Christmas bird count. Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, as everybody knows, um, our bird count was December the twenty or sixteenth. Uh, uh, um, we couldn't have wanted uh, a nicer day or uh, you know month that led up to it. Uh, everything was absolutely perfect. The day was, I think, it got as high as about plus two. 
um, you know, absolutely no snow anywhere, absolutely no ice anywhere, all the water wide open. And as a result of that, um, you know, we had the best count that we've ever had. Um, I guess previous to this, uh, I think uh, uh, the individual total for the record was around 67, 6,800. And this year we had 83.48, so up, you know, unbelievably. Um, I guess water birds had um, a lot to do with that. Um, I guess people, uh, you know, could use their scopes, uh, you know, they didn't have to look out in the bay, uh, you know, 500 feet to see something. There's, there's a lot of stuff by the shore. And not only that, we had a lot of, um, I guess, records for, um, you know, individual uh, species. And uh, and then Ken was lucky enough to see, um, I guess, a Carolina wren, which uh, hadn't been seen on our count for maybe 10, 15 years. Um, I guess leading up to the count week, um, I guess a long-tailed duck was seen. And it's been uh, many, many years since we've had one of those on the count. But like I say, everything was just perfect leading up to it, you know, and the day of. Um, you know, so some of these records will be pretty hard to beat, I'm sure. But we had, um, uh, eventually I was, um, I guess, short of people, but then we finally ended up with about 47 volunteers, which is perfect. So, uh, you know, we had lots of people to cover uh, the areas. And uh, so we ended up with uh, 66 species. Uh, I think the previous record was, uh, was uh, well, it was in the 60s, but lower than that for sure. And... Um, I mean, what can you say? Like everybody did a great job, and uh, I mean, the counts were fantastic. Um, I, I just uh, kind of got a brief thing of some of the ones, uh, I guess, where we had a record for. Um, I guess European starlings, uh, American goldfinch, uh, I guess red-breasted nuthatch, uh, red-bellied woodpecker. Um, there just seemed to be, uh, I guess, lots of birds, uh, you know, at feeders. Um, uh, the day started off for us uh, a little slow, but then it certainly picked up. Um, I'm not sure that that was the case for everyone, but um, it was great. And then, uh, you know, we all got together uh, for supper at, um, I guess, the Y Marsh. And, uh, of course, we had our uh, auction again to, uh, I guess, raise money uh, for the Owl Foundation. And uh, we happened to come up with about $540. So, again, that was a big success. And uh, not really, oh, um, I guess next year's count, because of the leap here, it's uh, Saturday, December the 14th, and that's about as early as it can be. The year after that, it'll, it'll start going back again towards Christmas. But, um, yeah, I don't really have a whole lot more than that. Maybe, Ken, uh, you want to pop in with something that I missed? or No, I think it, it sounds great, and I'm sure, you know, Bob would, uh, I think there's little reaction buttons. Everybody wants to press their uh, applause for Dave. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. See, there, see on mine there? You can do that and give, uh, <laughs> give uh, Dave a virtual round of applause for doing there a good job on the bird count again. Thank you. That's great. So back to Bob. Okay, All right. Thank you, Dave. I want to thank you once and again for taking on this 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 challenge. Uh, there's a lot involved here. People don't see all the work you do behind the scenes, uh, wrangling, uh, wrangling volunteers and assigning count areas and, and coordinating, and compiling all the data. It, it's a challenging task, and we really thank you for, for taking this on. So thank you, Dave. And uh, that sort of concludes our club business. And I'm going to turn that over to Kate Harris, who is going to introduce our guest speaker. Hey. Okay, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm delighted to introduce Claudette Sims. Uh, Claudette and her partner in crime, Kathy Casavales, are two very hardworking women, members of the Halton Master Gardeners, who first floated the idea on Facebook of the need for control of a huge problem: the planting by gardeners of invasive species. This was back in November of 2021, and many, myself included, uh, rallied to the cause. By early 2022, there was an organization, the Canadian Coalition for Invasive Plant Regulation, a website, a dedicated Facebook page, an Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. The fight was on, 
to stop the sale of high-risk invasive plants that harm our biodiversity. Claudette, our guest tonight, joined Master Gardeners of Ontario in 2004. She served as president for six years. She was a regular panelist and lead on the weekly CBC radio online garden chat for many years and has subbed in for Ed Lawrence on the radio, which gardeners will know is making the big time in the horticultural world. Uh, Claudette is currently the admin for the very successful Master Gardeners of Ontario Facebook group. She loves to attract wildlife to her garden and her most recent passion is adding the native plants that will act as larval hosts for butterflies, as well as the native plants that will support specialist bees. So welcome Claudette. Thank you so much, Kate. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to do the screen share. Let me see if I can find that. And that should be that should be good. So hopefully everyone can see that. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Just going to collapse my I'm going to, I wanted to collapse my gallery because I can't see my screen. Thank you, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about uh, CIPR. We, we've shortened it a little bit easier than the mouthful of Canadian Coalition for Invasive Plant Regulation. I'm thrilled to come and talk to you. Now, I know you did originally, Kathy was supposed to do the talk, but as uh, Kate has mentioned, she's ill and she feels very badly, but she sent me in, in her stead. But I brought Kathy with us. This is Kathy um, in her, uh, near her home in Perry Sound. And Kathy and I would like to start by acknowledging and giving thanks to the First Peoples of our territories for sharing this land in order for us to continue our work today. As ecologists and gardeners, we can seek reconciliation by caring for and healing the land that we live on. So I want to start out by saying, full disclosure, uh, I'm not here to shame or blame anyone about invasive plants. Many of us have them in our gardens. I still have some. I'm doing my best trying to remove them and add native plants, but it's a journey. So let's begin that journey today. Um, so as Kata said, the CIPR really began with an outcry on our social media forum, Master Gardeners of Ontario Facebook page. It's an awesome group. We have over 45,000 gardeners that are there and we have a team of experts that answer questions. So in 20, well, in the last few years, but in 2021 specifically, we had a lot of comments about invasive plants. People would, you know, post something and say, how do I take care of this burning bush? Or what should I do with this? Whatever it was. And we would pause and say, well, you know, that is an invasive plant. So you might want to remove it from your garden and you might want to add something that's native or that's non-invasive. People were shocked. They'd say, what do you mean this is invasive? I just bought this from the nursery. This is wrong. Why aren't you doing something about it? So we decided to do something about it. And we investigated what was going on with native plants, uh, with invasive plants, pardon me, and Sipper was born. We did a lot of research and we found out a lot of things. So today I'm going to talk about some definitions, some common ones, some pathways to invasion, what the harm of invasive plants is, because that's hard for people to grasp sometime. And then I want to talk about regulations in Canada, why invasive plants are not better regulated. Then I'm going to finish off with some recommendations and maybe some action items at the end. I'm going to I, I do a pretty big, a quick pace during this, so hopefully uh, I'm not going too quickly for you. So let's get started on the same page. Well, um, that just, just before you really get rolling, I think I'll just remind people that when you, when you think of a question, pop it into the chat. And we'll have time at the end of Claudette's presentation to deal with those questions. So just a reminder about that, Claudette, and off you go again. For sure. Thank you. So we often talk about native plants, non-native plants, and invasive plants, but we need to all understand the difference between them. And there's lots of other terms for them. I tend to keep it really simple with those terms. So native plants, such as Rosa blanda, which is native uh, through most of Canada, is a plant that naturally occurs in those locations or in a particular uh, region or ecosystem. That native plant has involved, evolved in concert with the other naturally occurring species, with the pollinators, with the bees, actually with the place as well, that's important, and with the animals, the birds, etc. So because of that, native plants tend to support biodiversity the best. 
This is the kind of thing that happens over tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. It's not something that's going to happen in your garden in a hundred years that, you know, a particular plant is going to evolve and then become native. Non-native plants, on the other hand, are those introduced species. They come from somewhere else. They come from Africa or Europe or Asia, somewhere else in the world. Actually, they can also come from BC because a plant from BC can be non-native in Ontario. Then there are in invasive plants. They are non-native plants, plants that come from somewhere else, whose introduction or spread threatens the environment, the economy, or society, and that includes human health. So when we look at the picture, we have three roses, our native rose, uh, Rosa Blanda. This is a hybrid tea rose. Roses have been hybridized for, you know, hundreds of years. They, they first, a lot of them occurred in China. So you can see the difference between uh, our native rose and a hybridized rose. There's really nothing for pollinators here because the petals have taken the place of the nectaries, which supply pollen and nectar for, for pollinators. That's, that becomes another issue. So it doesn't necessarily damage biodiversity, but it doesn't support it. And then something like multiflora rose, which was used as a graft for a lot of roses, is a plant that when it escapes cultivation, it can actually do damage. And I'm going to go into that in detail. We also talk about weeds versus invasive species. So what are what is a weed that you consider in your garden? Oftentimes when I ask this, people will say creeping Charlie or dandelions. There's lots of different weeds. Some people said trumpet vine. And indeed, some weeds can be viewed as native or non-native. They can also be invasive or non-invasive. But weeds are basically plants that are growing where they are unwanted. We have an official noxious weed list in Ontario, which contains 25 plants. Some of them are native, such as poison ivy um, and ragweed, I believe. But most of them are plants that, ha that harm agriculture. Um, and I was interested that on the um, Ontario website, it actually listed plants that it said they harm agriculture, livestock, or workers in that order. I thought that was interesting. So workers are kind of at the end. And as I said, something like ragweed or poison ivy would be an example, both of which are native plants, and they are really good ecological plants, but they're not something we would want in a garden. And certainly I understand why they're on a noxious weed list. Milkweeds were, are considered noxious weeds in many provinces. Indeed, in Ontario, uh, common milkweed was on the noxious weed list for many, many years. It was removed in 2018, and we know it's an essential plant for monarch butterflies. Then we have non-native plants versus invasive plants. Um, there's quite a difference there. So most of our vegetables, our fruits, our herbs that you see up here, those are all introduced species. And then your uh, peonies, your delphiniums, your hybrid tea roses, they are also non-native species. They might not support native biodiversity, but they tend to stay put. There is, however, an invasive species in here. Can you spot it? Mint requires containment. Sure, you can grow mint, but you should grow it in a, some kind of a container. Don't put it in your garden because it's going to spread and it's going to just cause headaches. So there are, there are plants that we have as food items that we should be careful about containing. How do invasive plants arrive in Canada? Well, many of them have come as uh, unintentional introductions. This started with colonization when settlers arrived in Canada, and they come through a, different, uh, a variety of of plant um, products. But then we are more concerned about in intentional introductions. So some crops, some plants arrived as agricultural crops. For instance, wild parsnip was imported for that. And then garlic mustard came with settlers as a medicinal plant and a food plant. Crown vetch was imported for erosion control. All of these have become invasive. Japanese barberry was imported um, in the ornamental and as an ornamental landscape plant. And you can see the, the blue part of the the, um, this circle here, the vast majority of invasive plants arrived here intentionally and they arrived through the ornamental trade. So CIPR is all about regulating those plants so that they are no longer sold. All of these plants at one time were sold in the agricultural trade. Many are still sold that way.
So how do invasive plants spread from nurseries to natural areas? Well, it starts with um, intentional spread by humans. So gardeners go to the nursery, they buy a plant or they buy it through the internet, they put it in their gardens, they start growing it, and then because they spread so much, they are able to share it with friends or trade it or sell it on a marketplace. Some well-intentioned gardeners even will um, plant it in a natural area, thinking that they're improving that natural area. And sadly, we hear lots of reports of people who dump invasive plants and, and then they, they take over. So this, un, th that continues an unintentional spread where you have seeds, roots and shoots that travel by waterways or by the wind or by plants and animals. Uh, and then they tend to be spread by transportation hubs. Something like Phragmites is spread along our 400 highways by those diggers that, that go along the ditches. A lot of aquatic plants are spread by boats. Uh, why are invasive plants so popular in the nursery trade? Well, first of all, they're very easy to propagate. So that means it doesn't cost a lot to produce them. They grow, as you know, and spread very rapidly. So they are really attractive to gardeners, especially a gardener who has a large space to fill and can buy just one or two plants. And in, in a couple of years, that whole um, space is filled. They are disease and pest resistant. So they're very attractive to gardeners. I see this changing a little bit because for many years we bought plants because of their appearance, because they didn't have holes in them, um, because they didn't succumb to disease, diseases. Now we still don't want that, but now gardeners and ecologists are starting to see that there's a reason behind you know wanting some holes here and there in your plant that means you're supporting biodiversity but that has long been one of the drivers of um, invasive plants and then as you know invasive plants are really adaptable to conditions they can grow in dry or moist conditions in sun or in shade they're very adaptable gardeners and growers like them for that but there are some biological traits associated with this that, that have a dark side. I wanted to add as well, um, because Kathy told me that you were dealing with Phragmites, there's one more, one more thing that comes into play. Um, we have a native Phragmites, which is very well behaved, uh, native Phragmites australis subspecies americanus. It stays put and it is good for the environment. But an, um, an invasive um, Phragmites was introduced years ago. And that one crossbred with our native one and created some novel genetics. And every time you have um, the seeds drop and you have new individuals that spread, it, 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 they actually they add to the competitiveness and the fecundity and they can dominate a site and just exclude everything. So Phragmites is a huge issue. And this idea of hybridizing with native plants also contributes to the loss of biodiversity. So each time a vendor sells an invasive plant, the chances for invasion success increase. This is called the propagule pressure hypothesis. When a plant with the right biological traits finds the right environment, uh, invasion success increases. And the more invasive plants are sold, the greater the ecological impact there. We don't always notice how the impact of invasive plants when they first arrive. If you look at this invasion curve, this is over time. And these are the costs to control on the right hand side. So at first an invasive plant will arrive, you'll really see very little, there'll only be a few individuals. But over time, and this can take a century as it did with purple loosestrife, it increases more and more and more. So you go from eradication being possible and containment being possible to by the time the public becomes aware of it, it's very unlikely that it'll be able to be controlled and management costs a fortune. In fact, in the agricultural sector alone, the CFIA has reported $2.2 billion annually to control yield loss of invasive plants and control the invasive plants. But what we don't hear reported is the cost to animal and human health, to tourism, to recreation, and impacts on biodiversity. Sometimes those particular impacts are very hard to um, quantify because they're not an economic-related situation. 
So I want to talk a little bit about invasive plants in your garden. It's actually, from a gardener's point of perspective, it may be really hard to understand the harm that invasive plants do, and they can actually spread. This is, a, this is actually a photo of my garden, and I just photoshopped in some invasive plants, and then I added this dude here. So as you're looking at this, are there invasive plants that you can spot? Were you able to spot this large red shrub, which is very showy in the fall, burning bush? or Barbary lingering over here, this purple Barbary. Then we have here, this is a very bad Photoshop of Periwinkle. What you might not realize is this fern leaf buckthorn, which is actually in my garden, the other ones aren't, is also, um, it's possible for it to be invasive because its offspring, when it drops seeds, can revert back to the European buckthorn, which is invasive. So let's talk about a few of these plants and how they spread and the kind of harm that they do. So burning bush is native to Asia and Central Europe. It is adaptable to a wide variety of soils. It seeds prolifically. And I think the birders in the group would understand that birds eat the seeds, from the burning bush, they go to the forest and they poop out the seeds and that's how we wind up with burning bush all over a forest floor. And then we also have rodents who, who spread it in the same way. Uh, this is a highly invasive plant that tends to dominate certain niches, especially uh, lowland forests. It is reported in High Park in Toronto and many other areas. It's now regulated in a bunch of border states and really you know, it should like be a red alert for our spidey senses. When this number of border states in the in the, the U.S. are regulating burning bush, it should send a message because a lot of these plants with climate um, change are going to spread further further north. And you can always look at something like the Invasive Plant Atlas, which will show you where burning bush is spreading. And you can see how wide that spread is. And often it's moving, it usually moves out in a, in a, in a, um, a splatter type of thing, but you can see that it would move north as well. Because this plant outcompetes native plants, and you can see there are very few native plants here, it has a huge impact on biodiversity. It would also cost a lot of money to remove uh, something like burning bush from this existing forest. One of the saddest things I've seen near my house, and I'm sure you've seen similar things where you are, is Beamer Conservation Area in Grimsby. I'm from Hamilton. This is about 20 minutes away. The entire forest floor here is covered in periwinkle which is native to Europe and Northern Africa. As you can see, it crowds out all native plants. In fact, it crowds out all plants. You can't see any seedlings on this forest floor. There is so much periwinkle there. Uh, it would crowd out trilliums, uh, mayapples uh, in the fall, goldenrods, uh, wild geranium, all kinds of different plants. We don't know how this particular one spread. Sometimes they're spread by, as I said, well-intentioned gardeners. It could have started by someone dumping periwinkle as well. Um, what's interesting is the leaves of periwinkle are toxic to mammalian herbivores, so it doesn't support any species of animal. It is a monoculture. This will only flower in May. And while some bumblebees might nectar on the flowers, then the floral resources are only available so a very, for a very, very short time and only to generalist bees. Uh, it won't support any specialist bees. Um, there are, there's no food for foliar insects. You won't see any holes in periwinkle usually. So it supports zero cap caterpillars. Birds need caterpillars to feed their young. So because there are no caterpillars, you'll have fewer birds. It won't support reptiles or amphibians either. So this has a huge impact on biodiversity, both of plants, but as well of animals that rely on those, those native plants. We are losing our sense of place, our whole cultural heritage. So something like our Ontario Trillium or any other of the emblems, um, Periwinkle is invasive from the east to the west coast, so all of these floral emblems would be lost. Something like our sugar maples that we value as part of our legacy as well, our Canadian le legacy, would not be able to thrive in such a forest. So that, that again is a huge loss. I went on a walk recently with Paul O'Hara, who's an ecologist in our area, super um, 
very well he knows he knows this stuff he took us for a walk in a forest in oakville and he looked around and he said this is a forest with no future because we have invasive plants because we have deer that browse any native plants are there that are there so you will not see this forest in the future continuing to grow so something like periwinkle creates a dead zone and now that i have everyone depressed i think you'll understand that we get a lot of reports on zipper since we've been asking people to um, submit photos where they now go out and walk on a, on a natural trail or in a park and it actually affects their mental health because they are so sad to see these beautiful natural lands degraded this way and you may have had that experience I'm just going to touch on Japanese Barbary quickly as well. All Barbaries were once banned in Canada because they carry rust disease in wheat. Um, in response to lo lobbying, though, 11 rust-resistant cult cultivars were allowed. This is from the landscaping industry. But the federal government realized that cultivars can also produce offspring that carry this rust. So that would be a threat to agriculture. So in consequence, in 2022, the CFIA, which is the Canada uh, Food Inspection Agency, said that we should not sell cultivars like Terra or Emerald Carousel in wheat producing provinces. And Kathy and I found this really interesting because this announcement came shortly after we talked to the CFIA in a meeting and we told them, you should be regulating Barbary. We don't know if we had an impact, but it was pretty soon right after that. So Barbary, again, is spread by birds via seeds and also by animals. Any piece of Barbary that touches the ground will root and come in contact with the soil when it comes in contact with the soil. This is a plant that's invading Rondo Provincial Park and many other areas. So it not only has negative impacts on agriculture, it not only reduces biodiversity, but again, is something that costs a lot of money but it has a darker side too. Japanese Barbary thickets, we have learned, create a beneficial microhabitat for deer ticks. They support higher populations of deer ticks than other plant areas. And in fact, there are twice as many black-legged ticks. And those are the ticks that carry Lyme disease. Um, it, and this has largely, so this is a health, a health issue. So again, another impact of invasive plants can be health. And it has all these, un, un, pardon me, I wanted to mention that this particular forest picture, this is from Lyme, Connecticut, where Lyme disease was first reported. And it's a huge thicket of um, Japanese Barbary in the forest. But it also has another darker side that, that is rarely seen. Japanese Barbary, like a lot of invasive plants, actually changes the soil chemistry. It makes the pH higher and makes it favorable for itself. It has a direct effect on herbivores and on detritivores as well, little, those little critters that are in your soil. So when you have something like Japanese Barbary, you have fewer amounts of herbivores and detrivores, and there are fewer kinds. So it, it impacts the biomass and the richness, and that indirectly affects the predators. So when you have a plant like Japanese Barbary, it changes the whole ecosystem of the, the area, and infestations can have detrimental ecological impacts that decrease native plants and animal biodiversity. This is another plant that is regulated in eight states. And again, our spidey senses should be tig um, tingling about that. We are in a biodiversity crisis. Um, the introduction of invasive species are the one of the primary causes that are driving this. Why is this important? Well, insects are those little things that run the world. Our future depends on them. I know when we talk about pollinators, a lot of times we hear about honeybees, but they are non-native and they are not essential for pollination either. What we are losing are all these insects and a, and a lot of our native bees. So it, this is a, an impact to human health, but also an impact on biodiversity. When we lose all these insects, we lose our native birds. We have lost over 3 billion birds since the 1970s. That is a huge number. It's almost too big to understand. If you were to count from um, to 3 million, it would take you 12 days. Guess how long it would take to count to 3 billion? So 12 days for 3 million, 
3 billion, it would take about 31 years more, almost 32 years. That's a lot of birds that have been lost. They've been lost for other reasons, but certainly impacts on biodiversity is a huge one. I'm going back to Phragmites for a second because this is a plant that impacts so many things. And I, wa I wanted to put it back in my slide deck because um, when you have stands of an invasive grass like this, they become a fire hazard. And some of you might remember that this past summer, there were fires in Maui and in, in the Hawaiian Islands, and they were caused mainly by invasive plants that that did this, that were that were that remained on the the land, and they dried up, and they just spread like like wildfire, literally. And again, just to, to reiterate, Phragmites is another one that changes. Um, the chemistry of the soil and releases toxin. It really, really, it lowers water levels. It impacts agricultural lands and can affect drainage ditches. It affects site view, uh, views, so it can be a road hazard and it impacts um, recreational activities. And again, what our concern is, is that these impacts are often not quantified at all. To make matters worse, we know that invasive species can weaken ecosystems and that this becomes worse with climate change. Something that I I wonder about personally, I don't hear it talked about a lot. Um, we're thinking of buying a new house and or another house, a smaller house in the next five years. When I look at homes and I see that they're they're full of Barbary or English ivy, I think to myself, how much would it cost for me to remove these invasive plants? And I think that this is going to start to impact um, home home costs or how much a, a home gets because. It's something that's already happening in the UK. If you have a house in the UK with Japanese knotweed, it you have a tr you'll have trouble selling it because first you can't get a mortgage, and sometimes you can't get in you can't get um, insurance for your house. I think this is something that we should keep in mind as well. And then I'm going to go back to that first slide that I talked about with native, non-native, and invasive plants. When we talk about what is the harm. I'm not trying again to take away your delphiniums and your hybrid tea roses, but you should realize that non-native plants support non-native animals such as honeybees, starlings, uh, English sparrows, and they, they sometimes support as well generalist species such as robins, um, Canada geese and squirrels, but they don't support our um, specialist species of they don't support host plants for butterflies and moss, and they don't support our specialist bees. Whereas native plants do that. They support specialist bees, they're larval host plants, and because they're larval host plants and they, they produce caterpillars, they support our native birds and they support a wide variety of animals. When you look at invasive plants, they support very little. They are bullies in the garden. They create dead zones. They impact not only animals, but also plants. And they can also support things like invasive insect species, such as spotted lanternfly and marmorated stink bug. Tree of Heaven supports both of those, and both are threats to agriculture. I read something recently about uh, cedar waxwings feeding on Nandina, which is an invasive uh, bamboo. Uh, it's not very hardy. I don't think it would be hardy to your zone, but they died after eating the berries. So again, if you want to support birds, you, there are some non-native species that are non-invasive that might support them, but your best bet is always native plants. Having said that, I can't say that 100% of my garden is native plants, but I'm certainly trying to do better. And I'm realizing that, that gardens are not just petal deep. There is not just about what they look like, but it's what they do for, your, for everyone. So with all those impacts, I hope you can speak confidently to a neighbor or someone you know and tell them why invasive plants are a problem. And know they might not be spreading in your garden, but they are spreading elsewhere and they are a, a real risk to biodiversity. So what can we do about this? How can we stop invasive plants from being sold in nurseries and who is regulating them? Well, Environment and Climate Change Canada, ECCC, is in charge of protecting the environment. That's their focus. They developed the Invasive Alien Species Strategy in 2004. And in fact, at the Kunming Montreal Agreement in 2022, Canada pledged a 50% reduction in the rate of inter introduction and establishment of invasive species. So we're on the right track. However, ECCC, 
doesn't have regulatory authority over invasive plants. That is up to the Canadian government under the CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They are to do prevention, early detection, rapid response, management, etc. of invasive species. They develop this collaborative approach where the government of Canada works with provinces and territories, municipal governments, as well as non-governmental stakeholders. So how does that work? Well, the CFIA has regulatory control over invasive plants. But their focus is on food security. It is not on the environment and it is not on human health. And even though we're in a biodiversity crisis, they are not, as they don't seem to be concerned about that, is what I'll say. We've had a, a number of meetings with uh, the CFIA. If we look at federal laws more closely, there are two federal laws the Seeds Act and the Plant Protection Act under the CFIA. The Seeds Act is to protect the quality of seeds sold in Canada, whereas the Plant Protection Act protects forestry and agriculture. But you notice here, neither was intended to protect the environment or public health. You're probably seeing a theme coming in, in my, my presentation. So under the Seeds Act, certain plants are regulated as noxious weeds. For instance, purple loose starch trife is a regulated plant under the Seeds Act. This limits the amount of purple loose drive seeds that are in agricultural products. But seed contamination is not the way, the principal way that purple loose drive spreads. It's actually spread through sales. But so if we look at the, the Plant Protection Act, they can pro prohibit the sale of plants by naming them as a quarantine pest. But they have three criteria, which are really narrow. And we found that this is our main problem. For a plant to be declared a quarantine pest and therefore regulated for sale, it has to have an impact of economic importance. And unfortunately, economic importance, they look at agriculture and forestry. They don't look at the importance of losing um, biodiversity in, in a trail or a conservation area or, or a park. If the plant is widely distributed as well, like purple loose strife or like the periwinkle saw that we saw, they would say, sorry, it's the horses left the barn. We can't do anything about it. There also must be some specific control measures in place to, to stop the plant. So those three particular criteria mean that very little regulatory action is taken. So for instance, this is a list of the current plants that are regulated across Canada. There are 25 taxa. The ones in blue are the ones that could be sold from the horticultural trade. So you can see that very few are from the horticultural trade, even though we know that's the primary pathway for the introduction of invasive plants. And when you look at it more closely, um, berberus species here and Mahonia, which is another berberus species, a lot of the cultivars are exempted. So even the ones that are in the horticultural trade, sadly, the cultivars are sometimes exempted. So what happens is because of this, instead of the CFIA regulating, it tends to push the problem down to the provinces and municipal governments and non-governmental stakeholders. Like here's John, John Kemp is one of our SIPR volunteers. He works with um, unseated, on unseated lands on the Grand River of Indigenous territory, and he's trying to remove giant hogweed, which is a horrible plant, which impacts human health but he doesn't find any support. There's nothing there to help him. So this leaves a big mess behind and it leaves a really uneven playing field across Canada because Canada is not regulating things. Many provinces, the ones in red here, have no lists of regulated plants or weeds or anything. They have nothing at all. A few, um, six of them, six six of our provinces have noxious weed lists. But if, as I've explained for Ontario, those noxious weed plants are usually agricultural weeds and they're not really plants sold in the horticultural trade. Um, Ontario does have 15 invasive alien plants which are regulated, but again, not many of them are in the agricultural trade. The only province that has regulated aquatic plants is Manitoba. 
even though we know that aquatic plants, we're just learning how bad the spread of those is. And look, we're, we're a country full of water and rivers. Plants don't respect borders. They're not going to stay put. So we really need federal le leadership so that we have um, an equal playing field for the public good, for fairness, for clarity, and for equity across the provinces. Because some provinces have more money than others, some have more capacity than others. So this is why we're really looking for federal regulation. So what can we can we be done? Well, we think that policy and legislative, pardon me, legislative change is required. We need to value nature and embed that value in it. And I have to say that even though I've got trees and birds and animals, people are part of nature as well. So we have to embed the human health into that. We have to enhance our laws and, and policies to include this protection of biodiversity. Other places have done it. The US Plant Protection Act protects the environment and agriculture and the economy. The Australia Biosecurity Act and the New Zealand one, they are also protecting biodiversity. And even the EU has regulations on invasive alien species that protect the environment. One of the problems is this model that I showed you, this collaborative model was developed in 2011. Since 2011, a lot of things have been updated. We knew in 1951 globally that there was a, a huge problem with the spread of invasive plants and many countries got together and um, agreed to a multilateral treaty to protect plant health at this convention in 1951. In 2022, this IPPC uh, guidance, the uh, International Plant Protection um, Convention, revised their guidance. And they now say that if a plant can spread into new areas, like periwinkle, and can cause economic loss, it is not widely distributed. Even though it's in a lot of places, it can still cause harm. And also that economic loss is not just loss in agriculture or forestry, that we need to account for environmental concerns as well. And that when we, do, do, when we decide on economic impacts, we can't have this narrow set of market values that we have been using in the past. So modernizing, modernizing our policies and putting them in line with the new IPPC revised guidance would really allow us to account for environmental concerns in economic terms as advised by this body. Other jurisdictions have done this. With improved regulations, the EU and New Zealand ban Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven is the favored host plant of marmorated stink bug and spotted lanternfly, which you can see here. It's a huge issue. Toronto has just, uh, Toronto, pardon me, Ontario has just regulated it. So it's not regulated for, I, I can't remember, it's not prohibited, but it's regulated, a little bit restricted, pardon me. What's interesting is that in, in 2021, the CFIA actually issued alert, an alert. They said, do not plant tree of heaven. Consider removing it from your property. But it was still offered for sale at the time. I haven't seen it for sale in Ontario recently, but I saw it just last year. So it's, that's all a recent development. And again, we have bordering states which are regulating this plant. So this is a huge concern. My other concern is that this CFIA alert did you see it? I didn't see it at the time. It's, it's not publicized. There's no education that goes along with it. There are a lot of gaps in this. So here is what Sipper is proposing. If you think back at that invasion curve, we need to stop plants from being introduced. So we need to stop those rates of introduction and sale. And as I said, Canada has already agreed to do that by 2030 with this um, the biodiversity um, global framework in Montreal in 2022. So SIPR is saying that we need pre-border assessments. We need preventative assessments. We need to stop that flow. All new plants arriving in Canada should be assessed before import. There are ways of doing this. They're called invasive plant risk assessment, et cetera. And there's, there's a scientific way of doing this. In Australia and New Zealand, these plant risk assessments are paid for by the importers. So there's no cost to the taxpayer. Then post-border for plants that are already here, we need to assess which are the plants that are doing the most harm. And we need to stop the sale of those high-risk plants. And then we need to really be careful about the sleeper species of plants. 
those that are moving, gradually meeting, moving north with climate change and with things changing. All of this information needs to be put into a national shared database, because as it stands now, different provinces regulate different plants using different botanical names. They're, they're some some of them just use the common name. They don't even have a botanical name. Some have missing information. So it would help federally from east to the west coast if we had a national database with this information. Now, a lot of this information is already in existence. For instance, the uh, Credit Valley Conservation Authority has a priority invasive list of plants. There are 188 of them. Kathy's made this nice table. The ones in yellow are currently still sold in Ontario. Those should not be sold. They are, they are plants that should be removed from sale. The Auditor General in her um, value for um, money audit in 2022 in November identified 28 plants which shouldn't be sold in Ontario and recommended that they should be regulated under the uh, Invasive Species Act. And if you look at them, the ones with the stars are ones that I found that are still sold. We should again look to the states because they are really forward thinking about this. Maine has 63 plants on their do not plant list. This is twice the number they had a year ago. We can also look at plants that are invasive in border states as well as in some provinces. So these species that I have in blue, which are regulated in at least four border states and in Canada are high risk species which should not be sold. When plants are sold, there should be point of sale labeling. Plants are products. Other consumer items have labeling to prevent, to, to um, not only to educate consumers, but also to allow them to know if something can do harm. So we feel that labels should inform when a plant can do harm. Kathy tells the story of a, a neighbor who bought a red maple and she was so happy she thought she bought her the native uh, red maple, a cerebrum. But it, when Kathy looked at it, she went over and spoke to the person. And she said, this red maple is not our native one. It's the invasive Norway maple. It's that red cultivar. So there was nothing in the labeling except for red maple, which advised this consumer on what to buy. So we feel that plants should have, um, for plants like burning bush in New York, we should follow this kind of model. It states that this plant is harmful to the environment. Um, it suggests some in, in alternative species. And then there are planting cautions as, head, as well. So something like mint in our garden would have um, a label that says, don't put this in your garden, put it in a, in a pot and don't throw it away, etc. And of course, all of this really needs to have the correct botanical name so that people know exactly what plant they're dealing with. So here are the solutions that we, we uh, are going for in summary. To protect our environment, our economy, public health, and biodiversity, we need improved policies and legislation. We need a national invasive plant database that is shareable from east to west coast, so that in specific regions, um, plants that are, are, are an issue can be uh, regulated there, or there is the information there. And there will also be plants that are regulated across Canada, those high risk ones. Uh, we need to have those pre and post border risk assessments of plants. We need to ban the sale of really high risk plant species to stop that spread. And we need the labeling to inform consumers. And then I think we need some stable funding for public education. I just read um, a report from CP24, which I pasted on our SIPR page from Bonnie Lysick, um, the past uh, Auditor General, when she did her value for money audit. And she talks about the fact that some of the inspectors are not well trained. They can't identify plants. Also, the public can identify the plants. So we need that stable funding for education. So rather than spending countless of uh, taxpayer dollars always map mopping up the mess, we need to turn off that faucet and close the primary pathway for invasive plants via the horticultural trade. And we are asking for all of you to help us. Here are some ways that you can help. So make sure you're informed. Uh, high, which, what, are, what is a high-risk invasive plant? Which ones are sold and regulated? Kathy has put super detailed list on our, on our website. Be a role model in your own garden. Refuse and remove invasive plants from your home as you can. I'm doing this gradually. Encourage others to do so. 
explain to others why it's that it's not invasive in my yard you know educate them about that because that is not true make it real share some photos of the invaded natural areas that you see um where you live and put uh, send us the photos or post them on our sipper facebook page those photos are really driving change because people can't argue anymore that something is an invasive when we show an entire forest floor that's covered in an invasive plant. Speak out respectfully when you see a nurse, something at a nursery or a public garden that has an invasive plant. Write about it on, in a blog, a news article that's in your society, or you can tell your story by sending the information to us. We have a um, a tab called uh, stories where we talk we have gardeners ordinary gardeners and people who talk about invasive plants in their garden spread the word about sipper and become an individual supporter this year we're going to try and do a petition so we need names um, if you go to our sipper web website there's a place where you can put your name down as a supporter we don't ask much for money we don't send you a lot of emails we don't bother you we just want names to say to the government look we have 10,000 names people are concerned volunteer with a stewardship group I know you obviously do uh, especially the, your your um, naturalist club um, I'm sure you're removing invasives and also heart societies do reach out to other groups uh, in your area we I know we have Midland uh, Garden uh, Club with us maybe they could reach out to other district 16 groups and service clubs contact your politicians uh, for the municipal, the mayor, we have a, a resolution on our website that you could share or send to your politician. Um, we have for your MPP, you can send them all kinds of information that's on the website. For your MPP, or, pardon me, MP, me uh, member of parliament, our white paper is so good. Kathy and I worked on this together. She sort of puts everything in it from a scientific point of view, does all the research, and then I do the editing with her. And then we also have all kinds of materials on our website that we try to create so that you can share things on social media. I love this poster with our lady who says, what do you mean this is invasive? It's on our website. This has the list of the 28 plants that the Auditor General has said that should not be sold. And finally, I want to thank Midland Penetanguishene Field Naturalists. I am thrilled to be talking. You're my people, ecologists and, and, uh, and naturalists. And also, I would like to thank uh, Midland Garden Club or the, the Garden Club as well. And I hope that you can talk to your executive and add your name to our growing list of supporters. I think with that, I am going to stop share. I know I run through that quite quickly. Thanks very much, Kathy. Um, let me just punch a couple more buttons here and then we'll get to some of the questions. See, I must have done a really good impersonation of her because you just called me Kathy. Oh, I'm sorry, got that. <laughs> it's okay. I, I, I'm gonna take that as a compliment. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I was knocked over by all the uh, all the information you gave us and my mind went went blank there for a while. There's a lot of information, and I realize I'm overwhelming people with it, but to, to me, it, it needs to be said. So, and you, you have the recording, and I can send you, I can send you more information. And if you want even more information, the white paper is. is yeah, and I know uh, your website is a, is a great resource if people want to go through things more slowly. Uh, yes, let's absolutely. See, let's, let's go into our chat and see. Oh, I, I see somebody here commented, mind blown. Uh, oh. That was Julia. And uh, a question here from Kate. When you say burning bush is regulated, what exactly does that mean? Oh, in, in border states. Um, so it varies with the border state. For some, it means it can't be sold. For other border states, it can only be sold if there's a label affixed to it, which is one of the things that we, we are asking for, correct labeling. Um, and it, it, it really varies with the plant and with the, the, the area, but each state has its own regulations. Does that answer the question, Ken, do you think? Yeah, I think that's what you meant because it's regulated. It's not uh, regulated in Ontario at all. Right. No, it isn't. And and I've got to say that Kathy is the expert on this. She's so good with it. I, I'm getting better. But when we talk about regulating, in, especially in Ontario, we have restricted species and we have prohibited species. And the two are quite different. So prohibited species, you can't sell them or share them. Um, restricted species, I've got the actual definition. And I, 
I completely forget every time. It's 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 less it's less specific. It's it's you don't have to remove it from your property, that type of thing. Whereas the other one, it's illegal to grow. You know, I think Japanese knotweed is one of those ones that's prohibited. It might even no, it's prohibited in Ontario, I believe. And you, you so it's illegal to grow to have it. So obviously, if it's illegal to grow, it's illegal to have it in your property. I'm pretty sure about that. I would double check it, but we do have a list of prohibited species. I can find them for you. Now, Kate, were you uh, raising your hand there? Did you want to speak to that question? Uh, no, I think uh, I think you answered it uh, okay. for that. Um, as far as Japanese knotweed is concerned, I know you mentioned in England, uh, you can't sell your house unless you declare that you have this plant on your property. And we haven't reached that kind of uh, state uh, of affairs yet in Canada, in Ontario or Canada. But I mean, in some er some parts of the world, the concern is so great that uh, the there's laws against having invasive species on your property. I find that, you know, uh, some of the names of these plants, it's too bad we can't change the common names to make them more noxious. Like, uh, God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, and who wouldn't want a tree of heaven in their yard? It sounds wonderful, but uh, but I, I guess we can't de deal with that. Yeah, I popped in um, some restricted, I think these the restricted plants in Ontario, but you know, you look at them, like dog strangling vine is restricted, but that's not sold in garden centers. So it, it's good that it is restricted, but it's it doesn't stop further spread, right? And what you just said about the names of the plants, we have Tree of Heaven, beautiful sounding name, right? But Ontario has just restricted that plant. Um, then we, th that, so there are beautiful names for invasive plants. And we have these attachments for things like Lily of the Valley. I say Lily of the Valley, people will say, oh yes, my grandmother had that in her garden. I have to have it in mine. It is so beautiful. It smells so great. But when you know more about Lily of the Valley, every part of that plant is toxic. So it's interesting. We don't talk about that. We never mentioned that, right? And then if you look at native plants, they often have horrible names like Joe Pie weed and butterfly weed. <laughs> Doug Ptolemy said that should be called Monarch's Delight. We really need to rebrand some of our native plants. And I think that the problem, the reason why they're, they have such bad names is they were named by settlers. Like the common names are settlers saw these plants they didn't know what they were they didn't understand their worth and their value and i think that's reflected in how we name them well we have a bunch of other questions to get to here so we okay. better move along and uh if there are more questions put them in the chat and uh, we'll try to deal with them uh shelly uh, just something maybe to comment on it says when i moved two years ago i brought in a kubota backhoe to remove 18 giant rows of sharon and phragmites clumps filled up a 20-foot trailer what I got were empty spots of fresh soil to fill with native plants. So satisfying. So that's the type of work you wow. like to see people do. Yes, I love to hear that. It's interesting. The Rose of Sharon one, a lot of people don't believe Rose of Sharon is invasive. It's showing up on lists. It certainly spreads all over my, my yard. And while it, you know, I used to recommend it for hummingbirds, hummingbirds tend to like it. There are so many other better plants that we could plant in our gardens than that. So thank you very much for removing both Rose of Sharon. Oh, and Phragmites. Wow, that that's a big job. Would a good start, this is from Marianne Stump, would a good start in limiting sales be to require non-native plant sellers to identify whether the plant is native? Well, I think you covered that. Mm -hmm. Then if non-native, they require a seller to identify what considered, yeah, I think you covered that in your talk. Yeah, we, yep. some of your... I did. And we, you know, what's interesting, Ken, is we are seeing changes. We, we actually are seeing, people are posting photos of plants sold at nurseries, and there's a label that says invasive plant on it. It's like, wow. Although it's still bizarre that they're selling it, but nonetheless, it, we're just going to count our successes there, right? Here's a question that maybe wasn't covered in your talk. How should invasive species, for example, perimoco, be properly disposed of when I pull them from my garden? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, when you live in a more rural area, which I'm assuming some of you may or may not, and if you are taking your garbage to an area, you shouldn't dispose of it, you know, in a, in a dump site, in a place that has a dumpster. Um, you should remove it. 
I, there are a few options. Uh, you can put it in, depending on how much you have, black garbage bags and leave it out on the driveway and let it decompose as much as possible. If that's not a possibility, put it in an area of your garden um, that is unused. Uh, make a big mound of it, tarp it really well and put something around like stones to keep that tarp down and leave it there for quite a while. So don't put it in the compost. Be very wary of putting it in garbage. Um, in Hamilton, where I live, they have fairly good phytosanitary conditions for garbage and for their yard waste, actually. So they we have a yard waste thing and they they will um, compost that at high, high temperatures for the required amount of time. That is supposed to kill all the seeds and the plant as well. But do do take care and something like Japanese knotweed, which I've seen up in Perry Sound and it's just terrible. Like that is a plant that we should be very wary of and that should be in a garbage bag until it's just like nothing. So be very careful, especially and especially with things that have seed heads. Um, you need to make sure that the seeds have disintegrated completely before disposing of them. More than that. Shelly asked, do you have a letter to give to a retail store? I sent sales staff are not receptive to passing on my concerns to their management staff. Something on paper might be a physical reminder and worth a follow up. Actually, we do. Um, I posted something on our Sipper Facebook page. Someone asked a question. I posted a bunch of like conversation starters that we could have with nurseries. So I have that. Ken, you're going to remind me to send that to you. And then as a consequence of that, someone wrote a letter and she sent it to me. But I have not had a chance to post that on our Sipper website. So I could send you both of, the, both of those as a follow up. Okay. Hopefully that will suffice. And yeah. you know, when you see these kinds of things, just make them make them your own. Like use them as inspiration to to draft your own letter. Susan Hurst says, "I have a barberry barberry, but it's not the red kind. It's lime green. Do you know if I should remove it?" Well, um, so you can look at that from a few points of view. Um, those cultivars have been known to, while some of them are not fertile, um, some of them any non fertile plant will often produce even if it's only one little plant then that plant often re reverts to the, the the original species so you have to watch for that so that is a concern the second concern is does this plant support biodiversity in any way and barberries don't usually is there an alternative native plant that oftentimes we buy these invasive plants because of how they look um, certainly it's not because of what they do for the biodiversity so is there another native plant that we could substitute certainly you're not going to find a bright you know lime green native plant but maybe there's something else so i would look you know examine those things in your mind if it were me in my house i would remove it um, you it might take you a little bit longer it took me a while to remove that fern leaf buckthorn. I, first of all, I didn't know it was invasive, but I've been looking at it from the it's not native point of view and thinking, I can do better than this. I can have a garden that supports birds and diversity. And actually, I've got to say that in I love my garden. And one of the things I love the most about it is not necessarily the plants, but the wildlife that it attracts. That, I mean, that's what excites me. When I go into the garden and I see a butterfly I've never seen or a bird I've never seen, to me, that's the joy of gardening. So if that's your joy of gardening, then start shifting to native plants. I'm hoping that that was a, a good enough answer for that person. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Susan, for the, the thumbs up. I see that. But Ed, why do you why do you think uh, other countries such as like the United States are ahead of us in this area? That's an excellent question, because when Kathy and I talk about it, um, she, she was originally from the States, so she's very familiar with their politics. I'm not as familiar with it. But when she talks about it, she says a lot of those border states are actually Republican states, which don't actually like regulations very much. Um, so it surprise, surprises her. But what I would posit is that the harm to biodiversity there is more readily apparent because they've had invasive plants for longer. They have warmer climate in general. And I think they're seeing the devastating impacts in a more pronounced way. We're seeing it here in Ontario, but we're so big and we have so much room that I think we, we think, oh, we've got, you know, we've got lots of room. We've got lots of provincial parks. But what we're seeing now is that you know, our parks are being invaded by these plants. So I think th the message is 
there a little bit earlier, partly by, by because of climate, partly because of historical spread there and th their numbers. I mean, they have 10 times the number of people, 10 times the number of people probably equates to a lot more spread, a lot more nurseries. So that requiring a lot more regulation. Somebody asked me that question yesterday, and, and I was thinking that maybe they also have 10 times the number of naturalists and uh, people in garden clubs, which uh, puts well. pressure for these regulations. And yeah. that probably that's, you know, the, the, the solution has to come from us. I agree. Uh, I think it does. I actually think the solution has to come from us. Bob Codd has raised his hand. Bob, you want to? Well, just on this on this topic of why the states may be, uh, my my wife Sue raised an interesting point. Is down there that each each state has their own state universities. They are actually agents in in the sense of the government, uh, and 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 the fact that they support. This is hard for me to describe because I don't understand it very well myself. But the the the, the universities actually support uh, farmers and other local initiatives like that. They, they work for the people rather than just educate people or, or, or you know, the, 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 the uh, diploma mill kind of aspect. So they, they have an advantage in that sense and in, in that the, the universities are working for the states. And, and maybe this is a way that some of this information is getting out. I think that's an excellent point, uh, Bob. Um, as a master gardener, I'm familiar with um, the American universities because they have what they've called extension. So there'll be yes. University of Amherst, uh, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, I think. I get yes. cities and, and, and states mixed up. But anyways, they have that and they'll have extension. And extension is their master gardener group. And it's also their, so their master gardener groups in the states are associated with um, a university, often which funds them. Um, in Ontario, we have OMAFRA, the Ontario Ministry of Food, Agriculture, et cetera. And they're actually the ones who started the Master Gardener program in Ontario. But that funding has just been diminished. And I'm seeing actually the same funding being diminished in the states. A lot of their extension programs are, are less funded than they were. If you are ever researching information, you want horticultural information, say you want Barbary, do barbary.edu. And you'll get the extension services mm -hmm. in the U.S. You'll get those universities mm -hmm. that have master gardeners, that have funding, and that have really solid research. But I do, we'll just run through a couple more questions. But again, and that'll wrap up uh, the presentation. But uh, if you're able to hang around, people, we've got a couple more things to share with you before everybody says good night. Uh, but Marianne Stump asks here, um, she's about to run a plant sale. What would you suggest as an effective way to convince residents with busy lives to pay attention when buying plants, et cetera? Well, first of all, if you're running a plant sale, I would make it very clear to the people contributing the plants that there are certain invasive plants you don't want. Which invasive plants? Kathy has a huge list <laughs> that I can share, but you can start with that the governor general, the, the auditor general's list. That That's an excellent one. It's got 28 plants. I'll pop it in the chat before I leave. Mm -hmm. um, that's so done. yeah, make, okay, make sure that you, you don't sell those plants. So make sure you don't sell invasive plants to start with. And then secondly, you know, have some signage. So those those couple little signs that I showed on at the end of my PowerPoint presentation, you know, we refuse invasive plants or something, like have some signage to explain to people, to educate them. And you, maybe with QR, you only have to have one with a QR code that leads to SIPR or something that would explain it. It's probably really helpful. Um, I, I think those those are the two biggies. Don't allow invasive plants. Make sure people understand why. And maybe start with a small number of invasive plants that are not allowed and then increase over the years. Because depending on where your horticultural or garden group is, it, it may be really hard on people. And again, we're not trying to take away people's delphiniums or roses. I've seen roses at the Royal Botanical Gardens near here, which are non-native, but they're surrounded with Echinacea polita, which is our, our native um, Echinacea or butterfly milkweed. It is stunning. It's beyond a rose garden when you add native plants to it. I think it adds so much. And I think I'll make this the last question. I'm if anybody else has something they want, I better hurry to get it in there. But um, Marianne again asked, what role would you say hired gardeners should play in guiding customers to use native plants? And we went up with uh, nurseries. Um, I, I'm not sure if anybody on this meeting has a, a hired gardener, but uh, 
Any comments on that? That's a really interesting question. Um, Kathy lives in Oakville, and they have a lot of landscapers that do their gardening. And it, it, there's a lot of leaf blowers blowing. And what she is finding in her area is that mm. the leaf blowers are blowing garlic seed mustards through the fences into her garden. So I'm sure that, that that's one thing that hired gardeners and landscapers are doing. Um, they are also... I think there, I, don't know, I was going to say there's, there's a, an issue of jumping worms, but that's a whole other presentation. Um, they also, I'd say landscapers, landscape architects, they tend to rely on the same plants all the time. And they tend to be non-native plants and they tend to be invasive plants. I mean, boxwood is an excellent example. Boxwood is widespread. Euonymus fortunii, which is um, one of the, the Auditor General's list, that's widespread. I think it's because they're comfortable with those things and they, they want to work with them again and again. They know that they're always a success in the garden. You know, it's those whole biological traits of invasive plants. Those things are going to be successful. So it's not going to die. The landscaper doesn't have to come back and replant it. You know, but there, we've got a lot of robust native plants and native ours that we could plant instead. Bill Sherwood just comments, we are in a condo with gardeners. And I guess a lot of people live in condos where you don't actually do your own gardening. Yeah, uh, if, if you're in a condo, get on your condo association. Uh, I I feel that I was, in some respects, I feel I could never live in a condo because my friend has the whole front of their condo uh, is all burning bush. It's just like too much for me. But you know what I do? I'd get on that condo association and I'd start replacing things little by little. I can be insidious sometimes. Bob Codd has another comment on that. And I think, Bob, if you want to make your comment and then take over. Um... <laughs> OK, um, I did put this into the chat, but I'm, I'm curious. I, I would be happy to send this white paper to my MP. I think he'd be receptive. Uh, where do I get my hands on it? Well, it's on the website, but I will make one okay. of the comment, Bob. You can send it as it is. But Kathy and I are, <laughs> she she spent all the entire fall, uh, you know, like October, November, December, editing it, uh, so changing it, and I'm in the process of editing it. And honestly, it's just, it, it's intense, <laughs> that's all I can say. It's robust, and uh, it's not ready yet. So we have a new version of it. So we are hoping that it will be ready for March. We would love you to share it. You could share the existing copy, but you could also wait for the March copy, and we'll put it out there um, it's right on the front page, right on our home page on our website. So the new one will be there as well. It, not that I need to get another email, but do you have an email list where, where we can get reminders of things? Because with me, one thing pushes out another and I, I never get around to doing it. We don't send emails out. Like I, we don't send them out from Sipper. Are you on social media at all, Bob? No, no, Facebook? Okay. those old geezers. That, that oh, yeah. Well, I'm an old geezer too. <laughs> <laughs> but I I do like yeah. social media. I find I find my people there. Um, well, maybe what I can do is put a reminder to myself. I might I mean share the white paper as it is. I mean if you want to do that. But also um, I'll try and remind send a reminder. Maybe send it to you and to to Ken when the new white paper comes out. Actually, Kate will probably see it because she's part yeah. of our our team. So. Maybe Kate can support me. And if you see that, maybe send that to Bob, okay? All right. Yeah, I can do that. Good. <laughs> so, uh, uh, an appropriate substitute for Kathy tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I challenge Midland Garden Club to uh, support our objectives and to contact the other District 16. We have not a single garden club from District 16 OHA. I think that we need to do, but we can do better, right? So you guys, if you guys could support us, we would love that. Thank you so much for your time and for inviting well, me. But well, thank you very much for coming. You did a stunning job and your, your presentation is visually stunning. It's it, it really <laughs> eye catching. Um, as you say, there's a lot to take in there, but it's certainly a it's certainly a topic that uh, that that needs to be publicized far more than it than it is, and uh, yeah, um, if we can get behind you in any way, we, we certainly will. So thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Oh, you're very very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.
if anybody's still hanging around, I think we're gonna we're gonna still do this. Take the opportunity to do what we always do as a naturalist club and uh, have sightings. Has anybody uh, anybody seen any wonderful birds or animals that uh, sightings that they want to share with us? Or plants? There's not a lot of them around, but <laughs> not a lot. <laughs> I saw a lot of snow. I've been getting cedar wax wings coming to our yard, and we have a mountain ash, which I, I hope, I truly, truly hope, is a native plant. But the cedar wax wings have been coming and devouring the uh, the, the berries on, on the mountain ash, and um, it, it makes some wonderful photo opportunities. Unfortunately, the starlings have also found these, and now there's almost no berries left, and we have. 50 to 100 starlings at any given time, and they're just waving up my feeders. Julia, has the hand. Julia, why don't you unmute? and uh, if you can uh, I had a really interesting uh, watch today. I was at Bayside Restaurant at Tud Hope Park in Aurelia, and uh, I'm busy eating my breakfast, and all of a sudden, everyone near the window runs to the window and looks, and this little, I think it was a mole. I couldn't quite tell, obviously, because I wasn't close <laughs> enough, but just this wee little thing was out on the top of the snow, scurrying around everywhere, trying to find its way back under the snow. But the snowmobiles, my guess, had destroyed their tunnels, had crushed the tunnels that they had used. So this poor little thing was, he was so tiny, was a runner around everywhere, trying to find a way to get back under the snow. And we're all just waiting with a bated breath for a hawk or an owl or something to come in just at that right time. But it got back in, so it, hooray. <laughs> Bob, I might uh, make up for any of the birders. I was able to spend a couple of days in Algonquin before Christmas. And if anybody's wondering whether they should go to Algonquin this Christmas, uh, it was, uh, there were pine siskins everywhere, uh, red crossbills everywhere, lots of them, a few white wing crossbills, um, hundreds of evening grosbeaks at the, uh, at the visitor center. Um, not too many pine grow speaks, but lots of uh, a good other birds. So it's uh, and uh, that this was before the snow came. Um, I imagine uh, there might be the birds might be more plentiful now. So it's uh, worth a, a visit to Algonquin. Any other sightings from anybody before we move on to other matters? I'm going to point the finger at Heather because I happen to know she saw some interesting bird just this morning. <laughs> I'm I'm there, Heather. Heather. Yes, I had some crossbills at a wind up this morning when I was out skiing. I wasn't birding, I was skiing, but they were out there. <laughs> now you heard them, but are you pretty sure they were red crossbills? Yeah, well, yeah, pretty sure. I yeah. I, I had the jib jib call and they were chunky. There was three of them right at the top. <laughs> so yeah, no, I'm pretty sure they were. Well, even even if you're not birding, if you're a birder, you're always a birder. It doesn't matter what else is going well, on. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got anything to share? I was going to say the guy that had the uh, uh, mountain ash, uh, if the berries are orange, it's an invasive uh, European mountain ash. If the berries are red, then you've either got uh, American mountain ash or showy mountain ash. Um, you'll often get uh, bohemian wax wings on um, um, introduced cr Japanese crab apples and also on um, European uh, uh, mountain ash. Uh, it, you know, if the wax wing has a red underside under the tail, then you've got bohemians. Yeah, uh, Doc, we haven't seen, we had lots of bohemians around Midland last winter. Uh, I saw somebody posted a bunch over by, I think, Washago uh, today, but. Um, so far, they haven't. We're, we're hoping they move in later this winter, but right now, there's not a lot of them. It's mostly, but in the last three or four days, a lot of cedar wax wings have been showing up everywhere. Well, for anybody who's uh, looking to replace um, um, some of your plants, um, my group, Ontario Invasive Plant Council, I'm a director at large on that group. Uh, we have two uh, guides called. Uh, the Grow Me Instead Northern Ontario and Grow Me Instead Southern Ontario if you want to uh, find some alternatives to uh, some of the um, um, non-native uh, plants that you may have in your garden. And that's uh, your group is called the Ontario Invasive Plant Council? That's correct. Why don't you put your email into the chat so people can see it? Sure. Okay. And um, 
with that, I think we're just about ready to wrap up, Bob, but we had one little other special thing we thought we'd try to share. Uh, Kate, Kate was maybe going to tell us about it. Not yeah, there we so, uh, so this is a video that were, was created by the people who make the allotments in Jonesville, Buzz. Uh, where is Jonesville, you ask? It's uh, in the um, Eglinton Avenue area, east of the Don Valley Parkway. And I have a friend there, Gabby. Uh, we kind of met online talking about plants. And uh, recent, uh, this past summer, I went and visited the Jonesville allotments. Uh, allotments are basically about growing food, but pollinators are so important uh, for that. And uh, the Jonesville gardeners supply what they need. So those are native plants. So here's the video. And well, just before I run that or try to run that, I'll just remind people we've got two more Zoom meetings in the winter here uh, on uh, Thursday, February 15th. Um, we'll have a Zoom meeting and Emily Conger is going to sp speak to us about the Algonquin to Adirondack, Adirondacks Corridor project. It's very important that when we preserve, um, when we um, preserve natural areas that they're connected so that animals can move uh, and that helps them cope with climate change too. Then our last winter meeting will be March 21st, a Zoom meeting with the author, Bob Bell. Uh, Bob is known in the Hamilton area as Birder Bob. He's a very popular person down there, but. He, uh, he dealt with um, a very bad case of Lyme disease and wrote a book about it called Out of the Limelight into the Sunlight. And the subtitle is Birding as Therapy for Chronic Illness. And I've read the book, it's very interesting. And I think he's a great presenter, uh, should be a good meeting. Then in April, we'll get back to in-person meetings and we're quite excited. We have the uh, Canadian best-selling author, Adam Schultz, uh, coming to speak about his latest book, which is in the top 10 best-selling Canadian books right now, Where the Falcon Flies. And it tells about um, his uh, trip where he canoed 3,400 kilometers from his uh, front door in Lake Erie to the Arctic following the peregrine falcons. So with that, I'll try to share my screen and show this little video. And I'll say- One thing, Ken, if I can interrupt, don't sure. forget to remind everybody to pay their dues. It's it's up there right above your head. Treasure right. at mpfn.xyz. Yeah, and even if you just want to send us a little donation for the for the talk tonight, you can do it with an e-transfer there. Uh, all money is gratefully accepted, and we'll try to put them to good use. So here's that gardening video to end the night. Where is it? No, that's not what I want. Uh, give me a second. Yeah, take your time. I'm not going anywhere. There we are. I think I got it figured out. Now, they, we tried. Apparently, we've got some problems with the sound on this. Uh, there, there's some beautiful music that goes with the video, but you might have to go to YouTube or to, uh, um, to Kate's... Um, website uh, return of the native if you want to hear the beautiful music but we'll do our best Yeah, but it doesn't pass.
That was lovely. Thanks, Kate. Mm -hmm. That gives me ideas for the Midland Community Gardens. I think it's time for us to get into yeah. cinema. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I've got like With... little individual shots of bees yeah. and birds well, I've in got, our garden. I've got and videos. I was like, oh, yeah. Put music to it. How beautiful. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Did, no, that's did, uh, definitely did the got music the... come. Did the music come through this time? Yeah. It did personally. Yeah. Yeah, I think good. what's going on, Ken, was uh, when anybody would speak, if you didn't have everybody muted, when anybody would speak, that sort of uh, canceled out the music. So, uh, yeah, uh, that, that was our issue all along. Well, but I also found a button 